All right. Technician A says trouble codes will direct the technician to the circuit with a fault. This is electronics test nine. Technician B says trouble codes will locate the exact failure in the circuit. All right. Um, now, we all not both. They're not going to locate the exact failure in the circuit. Okay, and uh, you can get you're going to get trouble codes on all kinds of systems. Uh, you know the different trouble codes are your P codes, your C codes, your B codes, and your U codes. Okay. Do you know what C codes are? Chassis, like brakes and suspension, uh, the ones that are electronic. Oh, what about B codes? What's a grand opening? Body. What's a body, body code? That's right. What's a U code? Undercarriage. Network. Network? A U code is a network code. I don't know why they don't call that an N code, but they call it. I off a BMW the other day. It was like a 347G. Yeah. And I was like. Yeah. <laughs> you're gonna have to yeah. this one. You get into that stuff there. Anyway, that's basically going to be. It's going to direct the technician to the circuit with a fault, but it is not going to tell them exactly what the failure is in the circuit. Like for instance, if you have a oxidized terminal in the circuit, or if you've got uh, something that's like uh, resistance in it for whatever reason, you know, it's not going to tell you that to go to this particular connector and look at this particular crimp to see if that particular, it's not going to tell you that, it's, it, it's, it's checking that whole line to see if it sees what it expects to see there. You know how I told you, uh, whenever the uh, people that typed these programs, these algorithms and stuff that the computer operates on, so, uh, they know that it's turning on that side of the circuit and they know they should see that voltage here if the control side of the circuit's not grounded and that's basically what's going on here. Technician A says to test sensor signals, a breakout box can be used. Technician B says sensors can only be tested with a scan tool. Now, what's a breakout box? It's a plug, isn't it? Actually, what you have is you've got something that plugs in between the wire harness and the controller, uh, and or it can just be plugged into the wire harness, and it's got a panel here with a bunch of uh, test points on it. You've seen the big breakout box we've hooked onto the Ranger. You ever seen that one? You remember the one with my big thing? It's got 104 pins on it, you know. And then you plug it into the wire harness. And if you know what, you know which pin is what, you can check them right here without having to fool with going to the actual connector there. Okay. Uh, but uh, number two is A. Technician A is the only one that's right there. Technician say sensors can only be tested with a scan tool. Only is that is the flag whenever you're doing a question like this. Okay. Technician A says. Oh, by the way, if y'all don't have one of these, give them, give them one of these. Give them one of these. There's two over there. Need one of these. You'll read that. That's required reading. That's required reading. Okay. Uh, technician A said positive temperature coefficient thermistors increase their resistance as the temperature increases, and technician B says as the temperature decreases, negative coefficient thermistors reduce their resistance. All right. What is a positive temperature coefficient thermistor? When the temperature goes up. The up. Resistance goes up along with temperature. And give me an example of something that's positive temperature coefficient. Cool temperature. Any component? No, that's backwards. Sensors on the vehicles are negative temperature coefficient, which means the hotter they get, the less resistance they have. And that's sort of counterintuitive. You wouldn't expect that. So that's how come I think of it being negative temperature coefficient is what you don't expect. Yeah. yeah, it seems like it would get more heat with more resistance, like normal, like copper wire does, or like a light bulb. Yeah. Has basically got more resistance with more uh, heat and everything. Okay, so that's how that particular stuff works there. Uh, but number three is basically going to be A because the only guy that's right. They increase their resistance as temperature increases, and uh, negative temperature coefficient just helps with that. Which of the following would not be considered a computer input? Now, this is these questions are pretty interesting here. Uh, is the throttle position sensor an input? Yes. Is the park neutral switch an input? Yes. What about the magnetic pulse generator, which would be like a camera crank sensor or something like that? Huh? Yeah. It is. What about the EGR vent solenoid? No. Well, what is that? I don't know. It's an output. If it's a solenoid, a solenoid is not an input, it's an output. If the computer is telling something to do something, if it's a relay or if it's a, you know, interesting thing about relays is sometimes the computer will turn on the relay and then it will use what the relay is delivering as an input. So it'll have an input and an output, you know, that's the same component. Um, like one of the things a computer likes to do, if it's uh, when you're talking about a fuel pump circuit, 
You know, I'm always talking about if you've got a fuel pump motor, you got a fuel pump motor here that's grounded. Okay, and the relay, let's draw that relay a different way. The relay is like this. Got me? All right, now this right here is going to be B plus from somewhere. Okay, this right here is going to be PCM. Okay, the PCM is going to energize that relay and it's going to cause this here to snap over there. Okay, well something else they decided to do later was let the PCM read that. Well, the ones that I was familiar with, it was pin 8. And whenever this relay is in this position, of course it's got B plus 2. When the relay is in this position, what am I reading right here? Zero. I'm actually going to read what? A ground. Yeah. Right? I want to read a ground coming through here. When I turn on this relay, that ground should go away and I should read 12 volts there. All right, now my PCM is smart enough to know that if it has told the fuel pump relay to turn on and this ground doesn't change to 12 volts, then that relay is inoperative or you got a bad circuit. You got me? You can figure that out yourself, but the PCM is it's an easy algorithm to type if you're a computer programmer. You know, you're looking at this pin, this pin should change states whenever you energize that pin or whatever. So this delivers the ground to that. It looks for that to change. If it never sees this ground right here, then the fuel pump is bad or that wire is broken. Start thinking the right way and you can fix stuff, okay? <coughs> All right. Uh, technician A says a not gate simply reverses binary ones to zeros and vice versa. Technician B says an and gate operation is similar to two switches in series to a load. Who's right about that? That's C, both of them. Okay. You got that? So... I will tell you that uh, some of this information I'm giving you here, like that particular piece of information there, uh, you will very, very seldom use that uh, and and not gate stuff to fix any car. You know, occasionally when you get really deep into something, I'll give him one of these. Uh, that's required reading today. Um, all right, we need to be able to you need to be able to discuss that intelligently if we decide to talk about it a little bit later. I mean, don't read it right now. We need to be doing the test right now. A park neutral switch is being tested when the transmission is placed in park position. The voltage at the switch is 12 volts. When the transmission shifted in reverse, the voltage dropped to zero volts. Technician A says the park neutral switch needs to be replaced. Technician B says the park neutral switch is operating correctly. Okay. That is a crazy. I couldn't keep question. Question. That is a crazy question, isn't it? You know. Okay, so. If the voltage of the switch is 12 volts, okay, this is, they're not asking you if that's true or not. They're saying, when the transmission is placed in park, the voltage of the switch is 12 volts. All right, you shift it into reverse, it drops to zero volts. That means it's working. Yeah, well, the, it's operating correctly, yeah. Uh, but so park neutral switches are so different nowadays. Uh, most all of them are going to give you starter uh, no, operation. Geez. They're also going to tell you what does the park neutral switch do besides making it where you don't have to, where you can't start it anywhere except park or neutral. It turns on the backup lights, but it does something else. What does it usually do nowadays? On just about every vehicle out there, it's reporting to the PCM what gear you're in, and it'll be a digital sensor with four on-off switches in it, and there's a little four place binary code in place there. You know, if I was thinking about this, I would think, okay, when I put it in low gear, then one of these switches ought to be closed, one of these four switches. When I put it in second gear, two of them ought to be closed. When I put it in third gear, three ought to be closed. And one of, well, that ain't the way it is. It's all over the place. And if you look at the way that the thing is drawn, you know, that, that, that binary number, you know, it's got voltages <coughs> feeding out of that thing. That binary number is calculated uh, the algorithm is typed so that this particular binary number equals drive, this particular binary number equals park. You know, so just think about these digital transmission range sensors. The Ranger has one of those on it. I mean, they started doing that years ago. And so it's got four on-off switches built in. Then there's some analog ones that work like a throttle position sensor. That's what I think the uh, Mercury uh, that we've got, that Sable's got on it. Uh, but you got, you got to be able to understand that stuff uh, or you're going to crash and burn. Number seven. What is the whetstone bridge used to measure? All of the above. All of the above. Pressure, temperature, mechanical strain. Technician A says the output of one computer can also be used as an input to another computer. Yeah. Technician B yeah. says a sensor is an output device. 
Okay, it's only a sensor as an input device. Uh, technician A says electrostatic discharge will destroy a PROM chip. Yep. Technician B says installing a PROM chip backwards will immediately destroy the chip. Uh, let's see. Both of those guys are right, but I'm going to tell you something. This is an antiquated question because you almost never fool with PROM chips anymore. <laughs> Yeah. That's old stuff. That's old technology that General Motors, whenever General Motors, when you replaced an engine controller on a General Motors car back in the early 90s or before OBD2 came out, uh, you had to take a little cover off of there and there was a little centipede chip that you had to get. And occasionally you would fix a vehicle by replacing the PROM chip and leaving the PCM alone. And then they also had another little chip next to it called a CalPak which was a calibration chip that made little modifications to the way that it did things. Those things are important too. Technician A says the high side drivers control the ground side of the circuit. Technician B says high side drivers uh, can be capable of determining circuit faults. So that's number 10. That's B only. Uh, high side drivers control in the hot side. Low side drivers the ground side. Uh, in my Darth Vader voice, I refer to the ground side as the dark side. You got me? The dark side. You don't know the power of the dark side. You know what I mean? If the dark side's not working, the whole thing goes south because you gotta. You know, the, I never showed you the little piece of a PowerPoint presentation, which I ought to show you on Army men. The Army men are basically always gonna go back to where they came from. I did it to you, didn't I? Yeah. So basically, that is a cool little. Yeah, I had it playing up here one day. Yeah, that was a cool thing to to go to go through there. Okay. Uh, which of the following would represent the number 255 in binary code? A. Yeah, you're going to have, well, wait a minute, uh, are you sure? It's A, isn't it? No, it's B. Actually, the ones are actually the ones you're yeah. going to add up. Because the next one is 256. Yeah, there you go. So, uh, but actually zero is... All uh, zeros are zero. Yeah, all zeros are zero, all ones are 255. Which of the following is responsible for sequential sampling? Which of the following is responsible for sequential sampling? DMUX, driver, MUX, or register? That is a question that would scare the living daylights out of you if it was the only one on your final. Yeah. <laughs> hey. Would you you guys like a lot of questions on your final or not many? That all depends if they're going to be like yeah. this. Yeah. If there are multiple guests. Yeah. Then you'll crash if you guess your way through them. I've never had anybody that just guessed their way through a test in here, even if it was multiple choice, and make a passing grade on it. If you're going to try it, people try it all the time, you know. The only person that's ever even come close to doing pretty well on a test like that is Webb. And that's not because he's guessing, it's because he knows stuff. You know what I mean? He's, he can usually, you know, just think his way through. But he's not guessing, he's actually reasoning out the answers is what he's doing. And, you know, he's, he's using his knowledge. But if you just go through there just randomly selecting question answers like I've seen some people do, you will go down in flames every single time. And you're going to lose. Uh, let's see. Uh, incidentally, number 12 is C. Yeah. Technician A says the microprocessor commands actuators by output drivers. Technician B says outputs are never controlled by supplying voltage to the actuator. That is a flag. Do not say... Never, although, see, the thing about it is, this particular thing is actually says B only. What? Do not say that. That is totally wrong. That answer is wrong. The question is wrong. Uh, output drivers, that should be A, not B. That's although the answer key claims that B is the right answer, B is not the right answer because some outputs are controlled by supplying voltage to the actuator. And I can give you some specific examples. The transmission control solenoids. Uh, in a lot of vehicles like Nissan RE401 and the 4EAT uh, Escort transmission, they are voltage controlled. The uh, sensors, I mean the uh, airbag spring uh, valves in these big in these airbags on the you know for the air suspension, those are voltage controls. They're actuators and they're voltage controlled. So that question, uh, the the answer key is, is wrong on that one. That should be A, not B. And I think it was just a sort of a uh, slip up. So if the scan tool fails to make, put? how are you going to put A? Cause, uh, okay. If the scan tool fails to make connection with the, P, with the body control module, the following could be the cause. All of them, any, any could be the cause except uh, A, loss of BCM ground, B, open actuator circuit, 
B open battery feed circuit to the BCM or D faulty scan tool? I'd say B. B. Actually, B open actuator circuit's not going to do anything except throw a code. Now, let me tell you this. On some, like on the green GMC out there, they actually have a connector where all of the modules on the bus are fed through a, a kind of elaborate jumper that looks like a comb, but it basically hooks all of those buses together and it feeds them into the uh, <coughs> diagnostic control, I mean the data link. If you're in a situation where you cannot talk to any module whatsoever, and you've got good voltage, you know, you got good battery voltage and all that kind of stuff, look in your uh, wiring schematic and see if there is a bus plug like a GMC's got on it or like some of the other vehicles have that is made, what, you're made, what that the plug is made to do is pull that bus out of there and you can check each network connector, you know, it's a basically a diagnostic thing. Well, if somebody leaves that out and you've got no scan tool communication whatsoever with anything, you can't talk to them. no module on that vehicle when that plug's pulled out of the way. And so uh, what you need to be able to do is troubleshoot when there's no communication and tell what's wrong. If you can't do that, then you're pretty pitiful. All right, let me see here. Uh, let me see, let me see. Yeah, that number 14 is basically going to be Technician A says a pulse width modulated actuator cannot be tested with a digital multimeter. Technician B says the pulse width modulated actuator can be tested with a lab scope, yeah, and that is B. Actually, B is the only one that's right because there is a way to test a pulse width modulated actuator with a digital multimeter. The multimeter that I carry in my pickup truck, which is the one I use in the field, actually will measure injector pulse width and all kinds of stuff and frequency and everything. Uh, it's good to have a good meter. The thing about it is uh, you got to watch it pretty close so somebody don't run off with it. A high side controlled actuator fails to operate. The tool displays zero amps on the control circuit when the system is turned on. Technician B says this may indicate a short to ground in the circuit. What is technician, B? technician A was just not even there. I don't know what happened to that question. <laughs> wow, that's incredible. Uh, it ain't going to be a short to ground because there's, there's no amps, right? Number 16. Um, you know, unless the short to ground has blown the fuse. You know, and there, that way there wouldn't be any amps flowing because no power would be fed in. Uh, that's a kind of a bad question. Just put B, you just go C on there and be done with it. A relay coil circuit is controlled by a low side driver. Direct battery feed is connected to the other terminal of the coil. If the BCM monitors voltage on the control circuit to determine proper operation, which of the following statements is not true? Boy, talk about a long question. A, the voltage reading by the BCM before the low side driver should be battery voltage with the coil turned off. B, the voltage reading by the BCM before the low side driver should be close to zero volts with the coil turned on. C, a constant low voltage reading by the BCM may be the result of an open in the circuit between the battery and the coil. Or D, the BCM will not be capable of setting control circuit faults. C. That's going to be C there, a constant low voltage reading by the BCM may be the result of an open circuit between the battery and the coil. Kind of like what I was talking about up here a while ago. All right, flipping the page. All right. The flashing of a computer is done to perform which task? Hardware. Repair hardware problems within the computer? Are you fix are you doing anything to the hardware when you reflash? No, you're not. That is a software update. You're updating the software within the computer to correct or enhance operation. There are um, let me see that uh, behind you, Lundy, let me see that set of power window switches right there in the gray. Down uh, down right there. Okay. Okay, well, let's well, uh, hand me that. This lady came with this trailblazer, and she had this thing right here. Her window it was making a lot of clicking noises, click, 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 and her window was doing this and this and this, and she was just really concerned and confused and all that, and I fooled with it a little bit, and it was just doing all kinds of clicking. And you see it's got lots of wires going to it, just, just lots and lots of wires. So I said, well... Looks like we're going to need one of those bad boys because we had power and ground going to it like we were supposed to and everything. If you got power and ground and it, you know you basically you're uh, you got stuff going on crazy on the outside, so I said let's go ahead and get one of these. So we got one, and I sent the guys out there and they plugged it in, <coughs> and it wouldn't work at all. And they said, well this just this must not have been what it was because we've still got power and ground. We haven't blown a fuse, so we plugged this in and now nothing works. I mean it's just like it's just dead, and. 
if you looked at the box that it came out of, it said something about it needed to be programmed before it would work. This is not a set of power window switches. This is a computer. <laughs> that is actually a computer. And this was a old trailblazer, like 10 years old. So a lot of the stuff that you think you know what it is, you don't. You wouldn't look at that and think it was a computer, would you? But that's what it is. And if, uh, whenever, it was whenever it was programmed, it would work. Now, basically, in, in those days, I didn't have uh, the flasher I've got now. And so we sent it back up to the Chevrolet flasher for $20. They plugged their uh, Tech 2 into it, and they horsed around. They said sometimes these are sort of aggravating. You have to pull them off the vehicle and plug them into a, something separately to program them. But they managed to get it programmed, and so she's been happy as a lark ever since. All right, so here, let's put that over there. Can you touch it? There you go. All right. Okay. Um, which method may be used to check a computer-controlled actuator? Yeah, incidentally, what I started to say uh, as a follow-up to that thing I was just telling you about, make sure when you're replacing any electronic component that you know before just plugging it in whether or not it's going to be programmed. You got me? That's really important. Um, I, got, I got something for you to do today, and you're going to have to be really careful to make sure you check to see if it has to be programmed beforehand. Okay? That's a $400 part you got to put on there. So you got to be really careful. We don't want to ruin it. All right? Is that the... That's the steering module for that uh, vehicle out there. So it's sitting in a box on, under the hood and all that. And you should really like that because you're sort of a Chevrolet buff anyway, aren't you? All right, man. Uh, so uh, anyway, I really had fun with the Dillon enrollment guys getting them to check the power steering fluid on that thing because they couldn't find it nowhere. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I didn't have it. It was electric. Um, but anyway, which method may be used to check a computer-controlled actuator, a lab scope, an ammeter, scan tool? What do you think? All of the above. You can use any of those if you know how to do it. You have to understand how it works. You also got to know how much amps is supposed to be pulled there before you can do it with an amp meter. The scan tool indicates an actuator is being turned on and off. However, the actuator does not operate. Like I'm telling my scan tool to, do, to operate an actuator, you know on this little, the two-way scan tool thing, if you're looking at a particular part and you're wanting to see if that part is good or bad because it's obviously not working and it's an actuator that the computer is supposed to be operating, Okay, I plug in my scan tool, I go into special tests, I go to this particular actuator, whatever it may be, evaporative solenoid, whatever, and I want it to cycle that thing off and on. I'm telling it to cycle it off and on, it's telling me it's cycling it off and on, but I don't see it happening. What am I going to do next? Uh, well, uh, what if it costs $400? Mm. Ooh, you better do a little troubleshooting before you replace it, at you? What you going to do? All right, typically an actuator has got power feeding it on, on, on the other side, and then it's going to have a control circuit coming to the engine controller. The engine controller is going to, op, you know, close and open a ground to make that actuator operate. Am I right? Okay, if it tells me that it's doing that, but this thing's not operating, I'm going to want to go over there to the actuator itself, and I'm going to disconnect it, and I'm going to look at the wires, a pin out, and I'm going to find the pin that's coming from the engine controller, and I'm going to check it and see if that ground is coming and going there. Use a logic probe, whatever, in a situation like this. If I see that that light's flashing on and off, and that there's enough current there to operate that thing, you may have to use something to make sure that the current's there, you know, like a light bulb or whatever, if it's a current carrying thing. Then you do what Melissa said. But I'm also going to make sure it has everything else it needs. Because what's really disgusting, you can be just absolutely sure in your mind that this part's what's bad and wind up replacing something that didn't need to be replaced, and then you feel like worm dirt. Like you know? what happened in this? Yeah. What was that in? In that? Yeah, that particular part right there, that's an, that's an interesting story, but, you know, we'll, we'll go there in a minute. In a minute. But uh, one time, you know, I was used to doing this uh, uh, thing where I do the fuel pump relay thing. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, Taurus comes in. Uh, it's a no start. It's got no, no fuel pressure. I'm not here in the fuel pump. Okay, so I take my test light and I get it hot. And then I go to the wire that's leaving the relay, going to the fuel pump, and it's dark. I kick the gas tank. I don't see any activity back there. And I say, well, I replace, you know, 15 fuel pumps a week on one car or another, and this one here, a lot of them are these, so I'm going to put a fuel pump in there. 
So I get, you know, threw it up on jack stands because I didn't have a lift in my stall because I didn't like having a lift in my stall because it was in my way on most of the jobs I did. And I just throw it up and drop one corner of the gas tank, you know, make sure it didn't have too much gas in it, pop the pump out of there, threw another pump in it, put it back up. I was through in 30 minutes, you know, it pays like an hour and a half. You beat book time, that's how you make money, guys. Only problem is, I still had the same problem. Did you like it would? Did you like it would? No fuel pump operation, no ground showing up. It turned out that the ground was run all the way from the back of the car all the way to the doggone battery. And you know how some of these uh, uh, battery terminals will have a couple of ground wire, heavy ground wires coming off of the battery terminal? And those were all chalky and everything. And when I fixed that fuel pump ground, my pump woke up and came to life. <laughs> so I just had a bad fuel pump ground. But I parsed that and I said, this car, the pump I pulled out was the original fuel pump. And they usually fail at a little over 100,000 miles. And any time I've ever been in a situation like that, and I put the old pump back in there, it fails the following week, and then they're wanting to repair for free. <laughs> so I said, I'm just going to leave the pump in there because it's about time for it to fail anyway, and that's the one that came in. You know what I mean? So it's a sort of a triage. You say, you know, if you know that part fails a lot. Now, if you're talking about a $1,400 transmission controller, that's a different story. You know, I mean, it's, they do something different. But that pump didn't cost that much, and we probably kept it from a breakdown later on, especially since I fixed the ground. But anyway, you got to do your troubleshooting adequately in order to get to the point where you know that you've actually got to, you know, if you plug in a known good part and it works and you plug the old part back in and it don't, that's a pretty good indicator, right? Um, so number 20 is basically going to be A. Uh, that is really sort of the least likely cause is a faulty computer. Uh, if, you, if you plug the computer in before you do anything else, um, then you're probably going to be disappointed because in most cases, and I will tell you this though, this really ticked me off. Back when I was working on anti-lock brakes at the Ford place and did, always, you know, did lots of work on the rear anti-lock brakes and everything, and every single time I found a problem with one of those, it was somewhere other than the module. It was never the module, it was somewhere else. It was this switch or that connection or that, just whatever. The module was never what the problem was. So I trained this guy, and he got to where he was pretty competent and all that, and so he started working on his own. And he's working on any lock brakes, and he tells me, I think this one here has got a bad module. And I said, that ain't going to be no bad module. I've never seen a bad module on one of those. Well, he had a bad module. And the next four or five of them he fixed had bad modules. Well, I had never seen a bad module. You know what I mean? But he saw four or five in a row that had bad module. I don't understand how that worked. And some of those explorers would come in there, and it would be skipping up, 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 up. And they were nearly new at the time. It was about like 99 models or whatever. And uh, I always found those from before spark plug bad. What's number four spark plug going bad on all these cars for? And they weren't that old. And so I told Donnie, I said, number four spark plug goes bad on all these explorers. I don't know what's up with that. And uh, he said, I don't believe that. It can be any spark plug. I said, I'm telling you, it's always number four. And this guy came walking from transmission. He goes, I got one over here they gave me for a transmission problem, but it's an engine skip. And I looked and it was an explorer. I said, throw a number four spark plug in and see what it does. He came back and I fixed it. And now he said, I don't believe that. So he pulls one in. He goes, ah, I got one of these skipping now. And we're going to see if what you're telling me is the truth. I said, okay, I'll be interested in knowing. So I went into the parts room when he was in there getting his spark plug. And I said, which spark plug was it, Donnie? And he goes, four. <laughs> he didn't want to talk. But he says, but I had one after that that was a five. But I did have one that was five, you know, but I don't know why number four. But they had us replace all the spark plugs in those after a while because they were resistor instead of suppressor plugs and all that. Okay, now it's time for all of our short answer questions. And I'm going to let you guys give me the answers back for these. How about that? An AND gate has how many inputs and outputs? It's got two inputs and one output. Mm -hmm. What type of temperature coefficient thermistors decrease their resistance as the temperature increases? Negative. Negative. Bingo. All right. Number 23. Name four forms of actuators. Uh, Remember, MRSS. Motor, relay, solenoid, switches. Got that? Can you say that? MRSS. MRSS. Okay, number 24. What type of switches operate? On the principle that if current is allowed to flow through a thin conducting material exposed to a magnetic field, a voltage is produced. Those are Hall effect switches. Okay, finally, this is number 25. I gotta find number 25 here. Excuse me, 25. What list the four basic operational functions of the computer? Think about your home PC, guys. What does it do? It takes inputs. It does processing. 
it stores data and it outputs. Input from the keyboard, output to the monitor, hard drive is basically the processor is actually going to sort the ones and zeros out. Hard drive stores the information. If I boot my computer up and my operating system is up here on the screen, where is that operating system? RAM. It's in the RAM. It takes it off of the uh, PC uh, hard drive and it loads it in the RAM. You're basically operating on your RAM. That's why you need lots of RAM. Think of RAM as your workbench. These automotive computers got RAM in them too. And uh, they've also got a PROM. PROM is what? Programmable read-only memory. Well, what's EEPROM? Um, Erasable. Uh, you can actually erase it. You juice it up with 18 volts, you erase it, and then you reprogram it with new data. That's pretty scary sounding, isn't it? <coughs> All right. I know, but it can use the whole firmware. Yeah. One day, and I like to tell this story when I'm talking about, you know, reflashing and stuff, that's kind of what we're, where we're at today. Uh, this uh, Dodge pickup truck was for sale at the dealership where I work. And they said the guy drove it down the road, and he wanted the truck really, really bad. The price was right and all that. But it's hunting in and out of fourth gear. Ooh, 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 ooh. It was a diesel. Uh, I mean, of course, it had electronic transmission, but it was a diesel pickup truck. And uh, he said, if you can get that fixed, then I'll buy the truck. Uh, but I need to make a trip on it, like, almost right away. And so the salesmen were, you know, salesmen, whenever they feel like they're about to lose a sale over something like that, they're sweating bullets. And we were sort of swamped in the shop, so they ran it down to a transmission shop somewhere. Transmission shop said, replace the throttle position sensor, which actually is how it knows where the throttle is. Needs to know that if the transmission is going to know how to shift, right? Throttle, deep into the throttle, your whole gear's longer and all that. He said, replace the throttle position sensor, and if that doesn't fix it, we'll have to go into the transmission. And so they brought it around to moi, you know, because I'm always the one that they brought it to. I was, the, you know, the guy. And I hadn't seen this before. And, oh, look at that. So plugged in, didn't see any codes or anything. But the Mopar Diagnostic System, which I had bridged to the vehicle through the DRV3, they said, uh, by the way, this particular truck has got a reflash. Would you like to know more about that? And I said, yeah, I think I'll look into that. And it said, this reflash fixes the condition that causes the truck to go in and out of fourth gear going down the road. Hmm, that's interesting. So I'll reflash it. Reflash, and it didn't cost anything. You know, and poof, when I got through, poof, going down the road. And the old salesmen were so tickled about that, they brought me a steak dinner. <laughs> <laughs> they brought me a longhorn, you know, gift certificate by steak. Because it got, see, they got a sale out of it. You know, because, but it was a reflash. And the, the point I'm trying to make is when you're looking at something like that, and I've had more than one student that will graduate, and, and I've kind of hammered into your head, always check TSBs, identify all your resources. Don't just fly in there and think you're going to figure it out on the way. You know, I had one guy, one of the dual enrollment students here last week. Uh, I says, you need to check in, you know, this, this, and this on, and find out how you do that. And so this went straight to the car, and we're trying to figure it out that way. And I said, what are you going straight to the car instead of looking it up for? And they said, well, I don't fool with those books. I just get my hands on it. <laughs> I saw you rolling your eyes. I rolled my eyes at them, too. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Okay, uh, let me see. What type of input device uses the principle of magnetic induction to produce a voltage signal? What about your crank sensor? What about your cam sensor? I, I mean, basically, and one of the confusing things about that, listen to this, too. Make sure that you know when a two-wire sensor can either be a hall effect sensor or it can be a crank sensor. I always like to talk about Jimmy Hutto's van that he drives. He's got two-wire wheel speed sensors on it, but those are hall effect sensors. In spite of the fact that they're two wires, they got 12 volts going to them, they got a ground, they do a very slight switch, you know, 0 to 14 milliamps, back and forth, back and forth. You can actually hook your voltmeter up to them, and you can watch that voltage go up and down, turning the wheel slowly, and tell if it's working. Just because it's only got two wires doesn't mean that it's magnetic sensor, you know, magnetic pulse generator. But if you make sure you know what kind it is, Looking in your description and operation section of your shop manual on that particular system on that particular car, you'll be a lot better off. Uh, what's the brain of a computer? I'd say CPU, microprocessors, what they're wanting, right? Uh, what component controls contains specific data that pertains to the exact vehicle in which the computer was installed? What did you say a minute ago, Lundy? Prom. That's right. That's not where you wear your nice clothes either. That's the place where you write your stuff, okay? All right, let me see. The uh, 
What component contains, never mind, what converts some measurement of vehicle operation into an electrical signal? Wow. <laughs> Temperature, movement, pressure is converted into electrical signal by, that would be you're going to slap yeah. yourself, sensors, duh. You were overthinking it, weren't you? Mm -hmm. All right. So everybody was overthinking it in here. That's really unusual. Uh, list three types of computer memory. Uh, from, EEPROM. What about, you know, well, that, what they're saying here is uh, ROM, RAM, and PROM. Actually, EEPROM is in the PROM category. It's just erasable, whatever. Uh, okay. ROM, RAM, and PROM? Yeah, ROM, RAM, and PROM. What's ROM? Read-only memory. Read-only memory. It's just there. It's like stuff that you can't erase. Uh, programmable read-only memory is memory that can actually be, the values can be changed as they need to, basically. Uh, and then RAM is random access memory. That's kind of like your bench where you just throw stuff on there and you're going to keep it for a while and clean it off. Uh, RAM is cleared every time you turn off your, uh, you know, turn everything off. Oh, and here's another little thing, and this is an automotive electronics deal. Uh, the lady on the Dodge Caravan, uh, incidentally, I found that the uh, heater hose clamp that, uh, that you guys put on there the other day was not tight enough to keep it from leaking. You know, she came in and it was leaking water and I had to go tighten it with a rent, but it, was it wasn't tight enough. But anyway, uh, I noticed when I took it back to her, I said, I noticed your door locks don't work. And some guy that was standing in the office says, oh yeah, that's because when you go through the car wash, it gets a little wet over there on the driver's side and that keeps the door locks from working. She said, well, you can unhook the battery and hook it back up and they go back to working for a couple of three days and they quit working again. <laughs> And uh, he says, yeah, it's because of that water she gets in there and has to wait until it dries out. I said, wait a minute, you know, I don't, want, I don't really want to step on the guy's toes. I says, I'll tell you what, let me take it back down here and I'll see what I can do with that. <laughs> because there is a bulletin about reflashing that in, that controller to fix that. You got me? Now, you can take the battery cables off, touch them together, put them back on the battery, and it'll fix that usually. But all I did this time was I plugged in my maxi dice and went in there and I, re, you know, cleared the codes. It had a bunch of codes. And, uh... Boom, boom, boom. Now we got door locks again. You know, wasn't that complicated. However, you know, if it continues to act up like this, I'm going to need to, hook, you know, hook up the flasher and all that. Uh, of course, you got to pay for a subscription and all that. But anyway, um, explain the difference between analog and digital signals. Anybody know? Somebody give me an example of a digital signal in this room. In this room? Yeah. That, uh, the internet. Not what about the light switch on the wall? Well, that's, yeah, that's an injector there. That's your digital off and on. No, I said you cannot install that at him. Oh, <laughs> digital signal is off and on only. Analog signal can drift up and down through any voltage. You got me? So you got an analog signal. But now your oxygen sensor is a sort of an analog input. But the computer converts it to a digital input, and it calls the high side of that rich and the low side lean. You can have it see that on your scan tool. If you'll go, it'll have a little square wave going up and down, rich lean, rich lean, rich lean. When it crosses a certain, certain threshold, it considers that to be the high value. And if it crosses another threshold going down, uh, you know, it causes it to be low value. And it, just, it can uh, change that. What is adaptive strategy? Anybody know what adaptive strategy is? That's where it learns as it goes. Yeah, it's basically going to... Uh, well, you remember I've told you sometimes, and, and you may have... I've talked about this the other day. Let's say you've changed the battery out for somebody at the parts house where you work over there on a Dodge truck. And as soon as he drives in there, switches it off, the battery's a little weak. He changed the battery out, and now it won't idle. And he says, what did you do to my truck? Well, I just changed the battery. It's been adjusting the voltage. <coughs> it's basically it's forgotten how to idle. As the throttle body clogged up and a little bit, and the idle air passage is clogged up a little bit, it learned to give it more idle speed, idle air control, to overcome that. It learns to do that. It basically continues to tweak those numbers inside its little programming tables to make it happen. Well, the problem is... It has forgotten that when you take the battery off, kind of like clearing the stuff on the Dodge door lock. It forgot all of that hogwash. And now it's trying to act like it's a new truck, and it's not. 
So you got one that thinks it's a new truck because it's lost its battery, but it's not. It's going to have to be driven around a little bit, or you can clean those passages with carburetor spray and wash them back of the throttle plate out really good. And that's why it's a good idea, you know, when you're doing some kind of a repair, to go ahead and do the, uh, you know, take the battery cable off while you're doing it. Because sometimes you can have one component that's really bad and sluggish and not working right if it's a dynamically operating component. And then you change it out and it runs worse than it did before because it had learned to operate with that. Yeah, pass one of those to Daniel over there. One of these things right here, Daniel. That's a, something you got to read. All right. Now then, so adaptive strategy is basically something that's all over these vehicles. Explain the function of a high side driver. What does a high side driver do? Hmm? Yeah, makes adjustment. Excuse me, I was reading the wrong one. Adaptive strategy. Um, wait a minute. That's 33 is what I'm on. I got confused. High side drivers, which are MOSFET transistors, control an output device by varying a positive side voltage to the device. And uh, that is a field effect transistor. Um, and basically it's uh, what you're going to find like in that Hyundai, you know, for the blower motor and all that. Um, you need probably ought to, you probably, you guys ought to do a little research on that. It's fun to read about those. If you go to your Google and you type in M-O-S-F-E-T, MOSFET, you know, it's an interesting little thing you'll read there. Okay, number 34. Now explain the principle of the operation of a Hall effect switch. Have I showed you all a Hall effect switch here? In this, in this, that distributor's got a Hall effect switch in it. Some of the two wire Hall effect switches that they use uh, nowadays have got circuitry inside of them that actually switches off and on whenever the magnetic tooth passes by them and all that. But if current's allowed to flow through a thin conducting material that's <coughs> exposed to a magnetic field, another voltage is produced. Did you know that was in somebody I read somewhere a long time ago that was created by a dentist that he used? I don't know how he did that unless he was going past your teeth, seeing, you know, or whatever. I don't know why he do that. Or it had something to do with fillings. Describe the operation of logic gates. What's a logic gate, guys? What is a logic gate? Yeah, they're basically combinations of input signals that cause them to decide to do output signals. That's typically what you're going to have in a uh, situation where, where something you can think of that might use that. What about a high mount stoplight? You don't want your high mount stoplight flashing when you turn on your turn signals, do you? So if I've got a, I'm going to have an AND gate there if I'm going to build it that way. And I'm going to fix it so that if either one of these uh, signals is coming in, I'm going to turn that one on and leave it on as long as either one of these other ones. doesn't matter if one of them flashing, I'm going to leave that light on. Got it? Although a lot of them, in order to keep from having so many electronics, they just feed a separate feed right off the stoplight switch and run the other one through the turn signal flasher. Uh, describe a thermistor. If I give you guys a verbal exam with some of these kind of questions, are you going to be able to do it without notes? Nope. No. Well, you're supposed to be able to list and define and explain now, you know what I mean? It's a thermal resistor. Huh? It has a thermal resistor, and what do we use it for? Um, air temperature sensor. It's a solid state variable resistor that reacts to heat, right? Basically, it's going to... If it's negative temperature coefficient, it's less resistance when it gets hot. If it's positive temperature coefficient, it's good more resistance when it gets hot. Uh, most of the time, you're going to be using one of this negative temperature coefficient on these computer systems. Um, let me see. Uh, we're almost through here. Define a ROM memory chip. Can you erase the memory chip? It's installed from the factory that cannot be programmed. Contains a fixed patterns of ones and zeros representing permanent information used to instruct the computer on what to do in response to input data. It's got a program written that's into that. it that can't be changed. Yeah. That's what you said. What that. Yeah, see what see how complicated they try to make it here with ones and zeros and all that? All right. Uh, number thirty eight. Explain the function of a multiplexer. Multiplexer. Now that's a that's an interesting question that you probably wouldn't know if you didn't read the chapter. You got it? It's going to examine a bunch of inputs, and they are going to have a programmed priority rating. Now, if, if you fool with PCs, 
you know, your interrupt request numbers, you know. Yeah, that's what this is. They're basically saying, if I'm getting signals from all of these, this is the first one I'm going to pay attention to. And once I've dealt with this guy, then I'm going to pay attention to that one. And then I want to, you know, and all of that stuff is like the information superhighway on your car is coming in, and it's actually sorting this stuff out. And what is what do you think needs to take priority? If you're the multiplexer and you're getting signals from a bunch of different controllers, the most important ones are going to be your engine controller and your brakes, right? If you got any lock brakes, the ones that fall down below that or the lighting systems and the audio and all of this stuff that's not essential stuff that you don't have to have to be safe, you know. So I'm going to interpret and act on these other signals <coughs> first. But that's what the multiplexing is, you know, does all of that. Describe the function and operation of a stepper motor. Anybody seen a stepper motor before? Did anybody seen a stepper motor and didn't know that's what you were looking at? Yeah. No, well, not really. A stepper motor. What about the uh, idle air control on your GM car? A stepper motor. If you've got a stepper motor, it's going to basically have usually one power and three grounds. And it keeps that one power power. Or it can be the other way. But, uh, you know, they've got various different configurations of them. But basically what you're going to do is you've got a, let's say that you've got a screw that's on a shaft and you can, uh, every time I say I'm going to operate this coil and that screw is going to turn a little bit and then I'm going to operate the next coil and that screw is going to turn a little more I mean that nut and as I, if I can just turn that nut I can run that stem out and if I can turn the nut the other way by operating the coils in the reverse direction I can run it back in and you know how your uh, idle speed control on your scan tool has got steps have you ever noticed it's got this many steps more steps it's got the faster it's idling as it raises the steps, it's pulling that plunger in. doesn't move it fast. A solenoid won't work for that. Now, Ford doesn't use a stepper motor. They use something that the more current you put to it, the more further it moves its pedal. On the other ones, they like to use a stepper motor. So if you're doing this with your grounds, it's actually turning that little nut that's around that shaft and moving it. That's basically what a stepper motor does. And, and each one of these little things I was just showing you was a step. Now you can actually, uh, you, we used to have a little box that we could plug in the Jeep uh, idle air controls and it had, would put out that right signal to work that stepper motor. You can't do a stepper motor very easily yourself. I mean, you can go ground, 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 <laughs> but it's not, it's going to go so slow that you're not going to be able to tell what you're doing, you know. Sometimes you can look at a stepper motor and see if it's working though. And if you, you know, if you make the engine speed go down, you may see that thing draw out, trying to let more air go through there. If you got the engine speed going too high, it's going to go back in. It doesn't move very fast because it doesn't need to. Okay, so basically you're looking at uh, it moves the control device to whatever location is desired by applying voltage pulses to selected coils in the motor. That kind of stuff is what you need to be able to put into words. Name the components that should be could be should be visually inspected before attempting to test the BCM control system. Sensors, electrical connections, ground connections, wiring, and all vacuum hoses. The, the thing that makes you feel so dumb is whenever you, you know, go to the point to where you just know they're replacing the engine controller is going to fix something, and it don't fix nothing, or whatever other kind of controller it is you're working on. You want to make sure that you've done all your homework and as much as possible before you replace anything. Uh, I'm going to close this whole thing. When, one time there was a anti-lock brake module that I was working on along the same lines what we're talking about. It was on an Explorer, I think, or a Jeep or something. And it was telling me it could not read the right front wheel speed sensor. But the, the right front speed, wheel speed sensor was good. The wire connections all the way up to the body controller was good. I mean the chassis, the uh, ABS module. Uh, all of that was good. The, the sensor was good. It was good all the way up to the module. I mean, I could actually unplug the module, and I could go, and I could read resistance there, and I'd switch over to AC, and I'd have somebody spin the wheel and see AC volts. And I said, so I called for authorization to replace this very expensive module because it was a warranty repair. And I said, I'm not getting a wheel speed signal from my right front wheel, but I am getting one from the left front wheel. And I know the sensor is good, and I know the wires are good. 
and uh, would you give me authorization to replace this module? He says, not until you do one more thing for me. And I says, okay, what do you want me to do for you? He said, I want you to disconnect the wires, you know, unkey them out of the connector, make sure you remember wh which ones you pulled them out of, and I want you to move those over to the two cavities where the left front sensor is. So we're going to let the left front sensor input part of that module try to read the right front sensor. Makes sense. If it will read the right front sensor, but it won't read it on those other two, we know the module's bad. But if you plug it into where the left front was plugged in and it can't see it there either, you got a problem somewhere on that, you know, between the module and the sensor. You understand? That was simple, but we don't usually think that way. We're sort of in a hurry and we want to get frustrated and throw apart it. If it don't work, then we get mad. <laughs> you know what I mean? So just if you just calm down and think about what you're doing, you know, you really shouldn't ask. I wasn't asking the guy for help. I was asking him for authorization to replace a module, but to satisfy his own uh, notion. Well, what is curiosity? He wanted to make sure that he was authorized and a needed repair. I couldn't blame him for that. You know what I mean? So I, w I worked with him on it. It turned out the module was actually bad. But you can do that if you say, well, I know this will read. I'm going to see if it will read this part that I'm suspecting. Anyway. Okay, so has everybody learned enough to where you can just fix about anything now? Yes. All right, then.